OK, thank you very much, Henry. So I will speak about topological friction and uh, electrophoretic patterns, as Henry said. So this is work that uh, uh, has been done in collaboration with Enzo De Witt, who, is, uh, uh, who are both organized uh, together with Christian Micheletti. And like uh, in the last talk, uh, oh, we have Davide Micheletto as well. Part of this work was done also with Andrei Stasiak and Luca Tubiana. And uh, the title here, hopefully you get uh, an idea of. Uh, we use this title, so we had uh, a selection between titles, and the wit said, yes, we want to use this title because we want uh, uh, the reader to say, I want to understand what the hell is topological friction after reading this paper. So let's see whether we can get there. So um, one thing that uh, will be important for uh, uh, the uh, talk is that DNA is uh, highly um, compact in all uh, uh, biological cases, and this is something that uh, De Witt and I used uh, in a uh, recent uh, talk at the Edinburgh Science Festival, so we can start with a quiz, uh, like in a pub quiz. And this, perhaps, uh, if you don't know, it will uh, stick in your mind. So that's to say how compact DNA is. So if we were to take all the DNA in our body and to stitch it up together, can you guess uh, how... Uh, long it will reach, and there are, since this was done in Edinburgh, one of the, quest the answers was the way to Glasgow, or the size of the earth, uh, you see. And uh, I will not ask uh, the question to you, one of you directly, but you can think of the answer. The correct answer is, if you want to, none of all this uh, uh, answer is right. The question is that it will reach all the way to Pluto and back which is quite uh, impressive. That's because one of our nuclei has about two meters of DNA in 10 microns. So if you have uh, 10, uh, if you have 10 to the 13th cell, it reaches uh, uh, about that much. OK? So at all level, so this, I think, is quite uh, an impressive number. And if we now look uh, more scientifically at uh, each uh, different organism, you would see that uh, this is a a micrograph of a DNA inside a bacteriophage, which will be important for the first part of the talk. So the bacteriophage is the virus of bacteria. It's about 50 nanometer inside, and the DNA itself is 10 microns. So if you blow up the bacteriophage and look how uh, large the DNA is, you would get this much. And also in humans, as we said before, a DNA is highly compacted. So this uh, uh, confinement has a lot of uh, implications, so today I will look at some uh, uh, topological uh, consequences uh, of this uh, high confinement. So I will start, uh, so the first part of the talk will be uh, on uh, the uh, physics of DNA inside bacteriophages, so the physics of uh, DNA within these viruses, and the second part of the talk will be trying to understand uh, uh, with a simple model, how experimentalists can tell which knot is which. So, thinking about bacteriophages, as I said to you before, uh, this is a capsid, so this is the container, you can think of a sphere where you stuff in uh, the DNA of the virus, which has to infect the bacteria. So, there has been a number of experimental studies of this system, because it's uh, perhaps the simplest uh, uh, living organism that you can think of, and the DNA inside, so there's been a few key papers about 10 years ago, which shows that at least in the outer layers, so close to the capsid wall, the DNA is arranged in a spool-like fashion, at least, uh, uh, so these are the uh, reconstruction that the experimentalists did. Okay, so this will uh, have some importance of what uh, uh, we'll say after. So this is a bacteriophage. Uh, it's about an icosahedral, so it's made by proteins. So this is the DNA inside. These are many of these uh, bugs, uh, uh, viruses. Okay? So this is for images. You can also uh, study the DNA knottedness. And uh, it will come as no surprise that, that uh, since the DNA is so compactified, it will be highly knotted. So for instance, this is P4 virus. Uh, so if uh, this is P4 virus, uh, sorry, uh, this would uh, um, have about 10,000 base pairs of DNA in. And uh, people have measured uh, how much the DNA there is uh, knotted. And you can see that in the wild type, so this is a wild type, 47%, so is about half of the DNA um, molecules that were looked at experimentally by Arzuaga and co-workers, yeah, are knotted. 
And if you have uh, uh, some mutants, so the trick that the P4 has in order to infect the cell is that it will keep one of the ends of the DNA rooted. So you've got a sphere, you've got an opening, and one end of the DNA is rooted, so it's easy for the uh, virus to attack the bacterium. So this is the wild type. And if you have uh, a tailless mutant, so this routine is lost. So both the DNA ends are inside the capsid. And as a result, uh, you have many more knots. I should point out here that in order to define a knot for a um, physical uh, uh, string, which is not closed, that is open, you can, for instance, keep it uh, uh, fixed as it two ends. So for instance, uh, if I have my extension cord, they are often knotted. So this one is knotted, for instance, it's got two knots. So this is not a closed string, but it's clear enough that it's knotted because if I keep the two ends fixed, I will not be able to undo it. If they can rotate, I can, and if they are free to move, I can undo the knot, but it still makes sense to think that if I have two ends, I can close it, and then I can ask myself how many times when I close it, I will have a knot. So in this case, we can... Um, give a meaning to the uh, uh, notion of, a, um, of an open knot. OK, so this is, about, so this is what happens if uh, we have, uh, we're a bit untidy and we store our headphones uh, cord in the, uh, in the pocket, for instance. When, uh, when you take it out, it will look a little bit like that, especially if you have two or three. And good luck if you want to see which kind of knot it is or if it is a knot or not. That's a monster. It's very difficult to characterize. OK? So there are a couple of things that I want to tell you about knot theory, which are important for the first part of the talk, which I should just uh, uh, review. So these are the simplest uh, uh, knots in Tate's uh, uh, table. So this is the unknot, this is the trefoil, this is the full one. So these are the two knots that I have here. We are just looking at the number of uh, um, crossings. So for instance, this is a full one because it's in its minimal uh, projection. So this is this one. It's got one, two, three, four uh, crossing. And this is a knot which appears quite often if you have uh, extension cores, indeed. And then you can go on in the 5-1 and the 5-2. So if you have five crossing, you have two types of topologically inequivalent uh, curves. So you cannot convert the one into the other. So that's why they give the name 5-1 and 5-2. So all this you know. I want to also remind you of uh, something that uh, will be important for us, is that we have two um, important classes of knots. One is the torus knot, which are these uh, red curves here. This is the 3-1. This is the pentafoil. The next one up would be the 7-1. And there are many other knots which uh, are torus and which are more complicated than this. And the blue guys are twist knots. So these are uh, knots which come up very often in an extension cord. And we'll discuss them a little bit more just now. So torus knots are knots that you can draw on the surface of a torus. So that's how you can draw the trefoil, for instance, here on the surface of a, of a torus. Or if you want, you can do that on a donut, as the editor convinced us to, uh, to do in, uh, in this physics world paper that we had. Okay? So these are the torus knot, the 3-1, the 5-1, 7-1, and so on and so forth. So this will be important for the rest of the talk. So if I look, so this is uh, my extension table, uh, cable uh, in Edinburgh. So this is longer than the one I have here. Yet you see, so this has got, for instance, if we just uh, review what we've been saying, uh, this is one, two, three, four crossing. This is a four one, so it's a twist uh, knot. And this is one, two, three, four, five. So there's a five, it's actually a five two. So all these knots uh, appear quite a lot because, uh, so here, for instance, I got a three one and a uh, four, one, and the reason they appear so often and the reason they're called twist knots is that you can easily do them by mistake if you make a plectonym, so you twist up a string, and then just by mistake you take one end and you put the hoop here, you create a knot, and this will be a twist knot. An important thing about these knots is that they have a knot in number one, so if I just undo one crossing, I have an unknot, okay? So this is different from the torus knots. So the unknotting number is the number of crossings that you have to undo in order to go from a knot to an unknot. So an important uh, property of the twist knots is they all have unknotting number one. 
So if you undo this crossing, for instance, you will undo the knot. So that's why this is a twist knot. So one question that uh, um, was always uh, puzzling for us is how uh, experimentalists can uh, use their techniques uh, to be able to tell so accurately um, one knot from another one. So you will know that they do by gel electrophoresis, but I think still uh, that it's quite remarkable. So what is done here is that uh, these are a series of twist knots, uh, and these are the knots uh, that uh, are in a phage, in a bacteriophage. So this is, uh, again, from the paper by Arzuaga and Muriel and co-workers, uh, where they characterized by gel electrophoresis uh, the um, complexity of the knots inside the phage. So that what they did, basically, they ripped the capsid open. So this is the virus, remember? They took the knot, or the piece of DNA which was there, ligated it, and then ran it through a gel, similar to the one that uh, Matthew was showing to you before in his first part of the talk. And then different knots migrate at different speed. I will say much more about this after. So what is remarkable is that you can tell quite a few of the simple knots, up to 10 crossing at least, just by looking at how fast they move. So if it moves as fast as a trefoil, it will be a trefoil. So you don't need to look at it. Yeah if you do a calibration. So this is quite uh, impressive, I think, uh, that such a simple technique, uh, just telling you how quickly you go through a gel, can tell you about the knot type. Uh, it can tell you also about other topological things, but uh, the knot will be most important for us today. And uh, if you look uh, here, and if you calibrate your uh, gel uh, um, electrophoresis experiment correctly, we see that you find the unknot, so there's this spot here. This spot corresponds to the trefoil, and then you have a very faint uh, spot which corresponds to the 4-1. So in uh, these bacteriophages, uh, under high confinement, uh, the twist knot, which appears very often with the extension cable, appears very rarely in the DNA inside the capsid. And we'll be interested to understand, if we can understand the mechanism, why this uh, twist knot uh, is not present. The five uh, uh, knots, uh, there are two kinds of knots. Uh, one is the five ones, the pentafoil, this is the torus knot. And the other one is the one which I showed to you with the extension cable, that's a five two, that's a twist knot. So again, so this is more difficult to discriminate, but you can do that with gel electrophoresis. So you, the, the pentafoil, here it is, and here you have a missing spot for the five two. So what is happening is that uh, we seem to have more uh, um, torus knot than twist knot. And actually, you can do more careful experiment. As this was already, uh, so this was a, a groundbreaking experiment a few years ago, uh, about 10 years ago, but many more have been done, and they all confirmed this remarkable thing that you don't have many twist knots within uh, a bacteriophage. So within a bacteriophage, the DNA is no different than in solution, but in solution, you find a lot of these four one knots not in the bacteriophage. So the confinement has to have something to do with this uh, uh, peculiar finding. OK, so round about at this time, we got quite interested. Uh, and I'll tell you, um, so I'll be more interested in the ejection, but I need to tell you a little bit about the knot spectrum, because otherwise it will be difficult to follow what uh, I say after. So we wanted to understand, so we do lots of computer simulation. I wanted to understand whether we could uh, uh, design a simulation to understand the uh, knot spectrum, so the kind of knots that are formed uh, within a bacteriophage. So the first uh, uh, goal that we had was very, very simple. This was uh, um, done with the Monte Carlo kinetics, uh, with the kinetic Monte Carlo model, which only considered the fact that the DNA, the bits of DNA, have a thickness. So if you are hydrated, the DNA has about the thickness of 2.5 nanometer. Compare it to the 50 nanometer that is the uh, sphere that it is confined in. So we have two length scales there. And we've got another length scale which tells us how stiff the DNA is. This is the persistence length, which is the length of which thermal fluctuation will buckle your fiber, and which is, again, 50 nanometer. So it's quite remarkable that the persistence length is very similar to the size of the container that uh, you are in normally. And indeed, this is of some relevance. And so we did this first simulation only as thickness and persistence length. So we put a piece of DNA with the right stiffness inside a sphere and wanted to see what happens. And this is what happens. So you have a messy structure, which is resemblant a bit of, the, uh, of a very messy spool. That's not, uh, yeah, this is some kind of spools would look like that, but it's very, very messy. So it's a horrible structure that will be highly entangled. 
And the, deep reason, well, the, the physics reason why this uh, appears is indeed that the fluctuation of the DNA, which, are, uh, uh, which you can think of as this persistence length, are about the size of uh, the uh, container. So if the container was very small, the stiffness would be, the DNA would look very stiff, so it would order more. Here the DNA looks relatively floppy at that uh, uh, scale, so that's why you get this very uh, disordered structure. And uh, if you run this simulation, which we did for realistic confinement, you can put or not uh, uh, electrostatic. It turns out it doesn't matter much. Uh, what will matter is something that we will see in a few minutes. You cannot even, we were able uh, to um, identify essentially none of the knots which we generated. So these are almost certainly knotted, but we don't know what they are. They might be the unknot, but it's very unlikely. But uh, yeah, we don't know what any of this knot is because uh, the knot identification routines which are available, uh, they, can't, they struggle if you go to a very num high number of crossings. So they can do very well until you have 16 crossings, perhaps a bit more if you simplify, but not if you have these monsters. Okay? So the bottom line from here is that if you take a simple model where you only have a semi-flexibility and thickness, so you have a very honest model of DNA which works pretty well in solution, you know, it works very well there. If you put it in a sphere, it doesn't do a great job in the sense that clearly the experiment shows that we can see some simple knots because we have a very nice spot for the uh, unknot, nice spot for the trefoil, and there is nothing here which is so simple. And also, it is not, does not resemble the spool-like um, ordering that we saw in the micrographs. So people were uh, finding pictures like this uh, in, uh, in uh, so six years or so ago. And one theory which was out there is that the micrographs were actually overdoing the kind of symmetry, so they were uh, making the DNA look like more order than it was. Okay, so people uh, thought about this for a while, and so. And we actually thought about this for a while. We then uh, tried to put in a simple interaction with the idea that maybe, maybe the simulation is not right, maybe we are missing something. So the idea here is that DNA strands are chiral, and uh, uh, if you want to write uh, a simple model uh, which does that in solution, you might get away without worrying about that, but not in confinement. Because if you have uh, strands, uh, so if you have chiral objects like these guys here, this fusilli that we use with Enzo to demonstrate this point, when you lock them at, an, at a very close uh, packing, they will, uh, sorry, when you put them at a very close packing, they will lock at an angle, okay? Which, is, uh, which depends on the groove details of the, of the fusilli in this case. And it will do that uh, in DNA as well, because you have grooves there and you have a helicity. It turns out that this is actually something which is well known in DNA physics. People have done experiments and shown that DNA molecules can form a liquid crystalline solution, which is exactly what this is. So when you tweak the concentration, you can undergo a transition from an isotropic to an hematic or a cholesteric phase. So in practice, uh, um, if we remember what uh, Slobodan was saying today, if you have chiral object, you expect a cholesteric, but the pitch is so large that uh, within the confine of the capsid uh, is very similar to an hematic, so the angle is about a few degrees. Okay? So comes, uh, here comes uh, this interaction. Let's see what happens. There you go. Yeah. So this is a movie from Christian that we had in the first paper on this. And you see that uh, if we have P4-like DNA with this uh, interaction which uh, parameter, where the parameter were tuned on the basis of this uh, uh, liquid crystal DNA experiment, uh, you form nice pools there. Very, very different physics uh, from a very simple interaction. Okay, there are two or three cases which will look exactly the same, so I will go on from now. Okay, so this interaction uh, would not... Uh, be very important in uh, uh, confinement. Oh, that's why, the, uh, because uh, um, it only kicks in when the strands are very close together. But it, uh, so it will not be very important in solution, so in an unconfined situation, but it will be very important in confinement when you force the DNA strands to come close together, then they will lock at this angle. <clears throat> okay, so these are the configuration that we get. Again, they are very ordered. There is a very high level of uh, liquid crystallinity, and there are some hairpin defects, as we call them, 
like this. The so DNA is a liquid crystal that doesn't tell the head from the tail. So. And this is what we would expect you know, for a liquid crystalline polymer. So now, the surprising thing, perhaps, is that uh, with this kind of interaction, the situation changes a lot. So this is surprising, perhaps, up to a certain ex uh, extent, but nevertheless, it's quite pleasing that if you look uh, at the... Uh, so this is a system which... Uh, uh, so this is a... Um, uh, collection of a couple of hundred simulations uh, where we repeated for each uh, uh, simulation the packaging process. So we had a sphere and we fed the DNA in. This is, in principle, a non-equilibrium process. So we didn't want to um, worry about uh, the glassy autocorrelation time in this case. So every time we had a single different simulation. And we just recorded how many times, uh, in this case, we found uh, a trifoil, how many times we find a 4-1, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is a thermodynamic system. It's only that it will get stuck in a metastable state, so you have to do it many, many times if you want to sample correctly the distribution. So the results are interesting because you see that you can now, uh, first of all, you can characterize the knots. This is quite nice because before we couldn't do it without the interaction. We have a lot of trefoil, a lot of pentafoil, so here are some 7-1. So relatively large amount of uh, knots that are simple that we know. And we know that they are appearing in the gel electrophoresis of the phage as well. The 4-1 is present, but it's very, very suppressed. The 5-2 is another twist knot. It's very, very suppressed. Okay? So at least within the simulation, we can understand that uh, we can understand how this uh, bias comes through. So this is uh, through DNA-DNA interaction, which you uh, would not have considered in a simple coarse grain model for DNA. So our view is that they come from a lining interaction, which gives some liquid crystalline order. And if you want, uh, you can understand this by thinking that if you, with liquid crystalline interaction, can stabilize somehow a spool, like the spool that... Uh, uh, sailors used uh, to put away your harpoon, okay? So these pools are very ordered, and they resemble a bit uh, a torus, so if you can form a knot there, it will be more likely to be a torus knot, okay? So this is a very simple mind explanation why these uh, um, uh, torus knots appear. So now, so the bottom line from here is that uh, we can, uh, just by tweaking the uh, potential a little bit, so just by putting some more de detail than we would have thought at the beginning, come up with a simple model to understand the knot spectrum, so which knots form within a phage. So now, the question that uh, uh, we had at the beginning of the project is, uh, given that knots form, and we, we know that more than 90% of the mutant uh, P4 is knotted, in order now for the bacteriophage to kill the bacterium, it has to make so that the uh, DNA will go inside the bacterium. So it has to eject properly. And if you have a knot, like the ones that I had before, you could imagine that the knot would form a hindrance, and so it um, would uh, uh, not be able to, so the DNA would not be able to eject properly. Okay. <clears throat> so what happens if we simulate ejection? So these are uh, um, some selected simulations here. So this is an unknotted chain which comes out from the capsid. So you should imagine that here you've got a sphere and you've got an opening here. So I got P4 DNA and then I let it uh, uh, out through this opening. So the entropy will be much larger outside the virus, of course, so the uh, DNA wants to get out, but the question is how it does that. And you naively might think that uh, uh, the knot could form a blockage, so that if you had a knotted um, structure, it would create some kind of topological friction, yeah, just to come back to the title, and uh, uh, stop the ejection. Okay? So what we are seeing now is another, so the knot, a knotted has come out, so this is another complicated torus knot, it's a 9-1, so this has got a knot in number four, so it's quite complicated. And still, it comes out uh, no problem. Yeah? You see no difference. And uh, yes, so this is another very complicated configuration. It's one of the few that we couldn't uh, uh, classify, and uh, it goes away no problem again. And uh, one thing that... Uh, 
I hope you will uh, guess uh, in the end is that uh, if I ask you what kind of knot uh, it is, uh, we don't know, but I'm pretty sure bet that this is going to be a torus knot, okay, for things that we will see after. So the reason why all these knots uh, get out so quickly or uh, do not have many problems getting out, uh, we at least thought uh, is linked to the uh, idea of knot localization. So if you have, uh, if you're tying uh, shoelaces, or if you are pulling on a knot, it will localize. So you see the knot will become very small. So when you pull on a knot, it will localize. That's how we tie our shoelaces. On the other hand, when we compress a knot, it will delocalize. No, sorry, I said at the beginning, so um, this is not. We have done simulation with the bi uh, interactions, uh, and uh, these are actually, we put the bi interaction, what I showed you after, and they don't make much of a difference because it's so screened in physiological conditions, right? So the charge will help uh, the, um, the physics, so it will give you a force to push out, but it won't change much the topological friction. Okay, so the knot, uh, sorry, I want to, so the knot, uh, when you compress, are delocalized, so you cannot uh, look at a small region, uh, say, close to the aperture of the capsid and say, is it knotted or not? So there is no local structure that can create a blockage, so that's why the DNA gets out uh, without much problem, at least whether it is a um, torus knot. So remember that these simulations were all done with a spool, so we're all done with a chiral interaction. So it's quite remarkable that we then, a few years after, we got, uh, again, at this, uh, uh, we tried to study more uh, uh, systematically the ejection simulation. So you see, at that time, the ejection is very uh, slow because it's only entropy-driven. So these are very slow simulation at the time. But, um, so, and we had to collect quite a lot of statistics. So that's why we didn't do them straight away, I guess. So the red guy here, so this is the percentage of the ejected beads, so it goes from 0 to 100, which is again P4 DNA as a function of time in milliseconds. In kinetic Monte Carlo, we can map to a, a realistic time scale by using Stokes law and diffusion and a few more things. Uh, so I just here give you the time in milliseconds. Um, it doesn't matter so much, though. So I would like you to notice the scale. So these are the interaction with the chiral bias on. So you see that the DNA gets nicely out. It's almost linear, actually, the way it does that. Whereas uh, with the, without cholesteric interaction, it still gets out sometimes, you know, three times out of 50 or so that I'm plotting here. It has gone out, but it takes a long time. It's much more slow. It's much slower. So this is an example of topological friction, because if you were doing a simple theory with uh, um, a, a thermodynamic theory, uh, it would be very difficult to guess that uh, so this, the DNA conformation, uh, so the DNA concentration is the same, the charge will be the same, semi flexibility is the same. The only thing which m changes is that there are some small interaction, in this case liquid crystalline, which has favored a conformation with respect to another. So in this case, perhaps I should speak about uh, conformational friction. But the, the spool has much less friction than the mass, as you would perhaps expect. Okay? And this is uh, something that is difficult to get uh, with a simple theory. So this is how um, you can see it uh, microscopically. So the spool uh, is uh, like the harpoon. So if you had a harpoon, that's why the sailor put it so nicely. If you want to put it out, it's easy, right? Maybe there is a torus knot, but it still gets out uh, uh, quite easily. Whether if this was a mess, it would be much more, uh, much slower to come out. So the, top, the bottlenecks which is created here is purely topological and is due to the conformation. So the entangled nature of this structure makes it difficult to, um, uh, to, to make it eject. And uh, in particular, you see that you need a lot of rearrangement. So this suggests to me that you could suggest an experiment whereby tweaking interaction so to, as to make the current interaction smaller or larger, you should be able to see uh, differences in the ejection dynamics, for instance. Okay, so there is another thing which I think is quite cute, is that I showed you only a part of the trajectories first, so look at the red ones, so now we are considering only the trajectory with a chiral bias, so these are the ones which work, right? The, uh, but not all of them start immediately. 
So this is another prediction that uh, we have done and uh, that, uh, uh, as far as I know, is not quite been tested experimentally, perhaps because the time scales, uh, according to our simulation, are pretty small anyway. So there is a stochastic uh, uh, element in this ejection, so some of the DNA don't eject immediately, and that's due to the fact that they are in a dormant state. So if you have a look here, look at how the spool is oriented, and look at this guy here. So you see that the spool, so the opening is here, so the spool has to do a rotation and, to, and has to present itself nicely so that the ejection can start. So before that happens, it will just stay put. So it will just stay put, and then when it starts, it goes very fast. Okay, so there is just a two-state biphasic um, resp dynamic response in the progress of the ejection. So if, you, if we look deeper, so this is, uh, let me see whether I can, so this is quite a simple plot, but there are too many things, it's 3D. So, so this is the knot type, and this is the probability of the knots, and this is the percentage of knot which has been uh, ejected, okay? So from this plot, we can see two things. One, if you look at, uh, this is a small probability uh, so a small percentage of ejected, this should say percentage of ejected DNA, sorry. You can see that you have an unknot, you have a 3-1, 5-1, is essentially the same uh, distribution that we looked at before uh, when the DNA was all in. So when the DNA starts to get out, it's perhaps uh, uh, nice to see and expect it, but you see that uh, you don't populate the twist knot, so you stay in the torus knot. So even when you get out, you always have more torus knot. On top of this, uh, you see that the knot becomes simpler as it, uh, the DNA ejects, as again you would expect. It's nice to see it uh, in the simulation and quantitatively. So another thing that uh, you can see, you can follow, so for instance, uh, we follow here one of the um, ejection simulation when there was uh, no lag, okay? And we can look at the uh, percentage of ejected DNA, so this should be in uh, milliseconds, it goes from zero to seven. And uh, you, see, you can uh, um, find here what, so this is the percentage of uh, ejected DNA, so you see that uh, it's not quite linear, it's got some small pauses, but uh, it goes all the way. So at the beginning, uh, this guy was one of the complicated knots, uh, like the last one that I showed to you that was ejected very happily. So it's got more than 30 crossing in the minimal projection, so this guy, we don't know what it is. But if you wait longer and a little bit, you see that it will simplify, it will have 20, and then it will go on this progression of torus knot from the 9-1 to the 7-1 to the 5-1 to the 3-1, then the unknot. This is very typical of what happens. So if you think about the unknot in number, the twist knots have an unknot in number of one, so they can be undone with only one single uncrossing. So the torus knots have more uh, uncrossing numbers, so the 4-1 has four crossings, so basically what this says is that the ejection uh, proceeds uh, in uh, a stepwise way whether you undo one crossing at a time. It's like you had a, a big spool and you are uh, um, uh, slipping away your tether little by little so that you can undo one crossing at a time. Okay, so you've got a large loop here and you are just uh, teasing out uh, an end so that you make the spool simpler and simpler. No, there are pauses. In this case, there are not so many pauses, but uh, there, are, uh, there are pauses and they um, resemble, uh, so there, there are experiments and people do see pauses and there are several explanations for this. Uh, yes, the pausing uh, becomes, uh, yeah, it's, um, yes, uh, you, you have, um, more pauses if you, as you go on. I should uh, review that, uh, that curve, but we did have that. We, I, we, we did look at that. So it's not a constant uh, uh, frequency of pauses. So some pauses are extremely long, you see, so they just get stuck. So very few cases of this, uh, um, so this uh, uh, DNA with uh, chiral bias gets stuck. And in the few cases that, uh, so this is very episodic, but. Uh, in the few cases that we have seen, this, for instance, is one of the few remarkable examples of twist knots. So the twist knot is very slow to get out. 
And uh, if you look at how, so this is one lucky case where we could uh, uh, actually um, find uh, how this evolved. And this is a 5-2, it becomes a, an unknown knot, and then it becomes another quite complicated knot that gets stuck then. So again, it's very different from the nice linear progression that you see with a torus knot. So the topological friction of a twist knot is much higher, it gets stuck. Whereas uh, the torus knot, so uh, the reason that we think uh, that uh, the knots can be infective, so the, the phages with the knots can be infective, is that they form this nice kind of uh, torus knots that can be undone one crossing at a time. So they have a low topological friction. So in the last 15 minutes or so, I will, uh, I will um, uh, discuss some uh, results that uh, we got quite excited last year, and uh, we are also uh, working on some uh, generalization right now on uh, the simulation of a gel electrophoresis experiment. So I will go back to that. This is trying to understand how experimentalists can say so uh, um, confidently which knot is which. Okay. So this is one of the other, uh, um, another slide from the talk with the wit. So this is how the agarose gel that uh, experimentalists use uh, looks like on a micrograph, so it's a bit like a Swiss cheese, right? You can think about it like that, or a network with holes. And you can ask yourself, which knot will move faster in this gel? Will it be the trifoil, the unknot, or the most complex knot? Or there will be no difference at all? You want to guess? Do we? <laughs> D, yes, that's right, that's right. So the more complex knots will move faster because they are smaller and they can squeeze more easily in the gel. Or at least that's what you would think, right? <clears throat> so this is why, so this uh, argument works beautifully for sedimentation and for, uh, so even if you have knots going out in a viscous gel, uh, you, you can see this beautifully. And uh, the reason in that case is that, uh, very similar, that we have a competition between gravity or something else, uh, or uh, the electric force, and uh, um, the friction. So the, so the Stokes law tells us that the force is equal to the friction times the velocity. And uh, the Stokes uh, drag, or the friction, becomes smaller if you have uh, a um, smaller object. So a smaller object will feel less friction, so it will go faster. That's it, right? That's not the whole story, though. And that's why we were interested in this. So a lot of uh, uh, biologists and uh, biophysicists use two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. So the idea is that you can have a little bit better separation. So this uh, uh, particular case, you have a first direction where the, um, uh, weak, uh, uh, where the field is weak, where the knots move uh, um, according to their complexity. So the more complex knots will move faster. And then uh, you have uh, another direction. So the unknot will be moving very slowly there. And you've got another direction in which you put a stronger field. And in general, in the stronger field direction, or in general, I said, in, in some cases at least, you have no monotonic mobility. So this is telling you that the um, unknot is moving faster than, say, the uh, twist knot, the 4-1. OK? So as a result, if you combine the two, you will have an electrophoretic arc. And this is indeed the one that was used in phase knots to discriminate them, to separate them, right? So if you only do one direction, you can't see them all uh, so clearly. So we wanted to understand why. And uh, in principle, this has implication for uh, other things. That's what we're interested in now. So if you have uh, uh, super, uh, super coiling, for instance, here, or if you have, uh, um, no, sorry, so these are diamonds. So if you have super coins, it's not shown, but you, if you could have uh, denatured loops, so this is the DNA which is denatured at several uh, different degrees. You could have a DNA which is more or less super coiled, as we have heard today, so it's got more ride. If it is a loop, it will not get rid of the super coiling. Or you could have uh, linked DNA. So gel electrophoresis will be, show you how to uh, separate all of these. And it will do that by using two-dimensional electrophoresis normally. So there's been a nice uh, work by um, Weber et al. So this is Paolo de los Rios and Giovanni Dietrich. Uh, so this is uh, surprising that there was not too much simulation work on this uh, uh, interesting problem, I think. 
And what uh, um, Giovanni and others did is they found out that it's important when you want to understand the mobility of knots in a gel to understand the, uh, to account properly for the topological interaction between the gel, which is modeled pretty much in the same way as Matthew showed to us this morning, and the polymer. Okay? So this kind of, uh, uh, they're not quite, uh, you can think of them as threading in a way. Uh, but uh, uh, slightly different. Uh, so these uh, kind of interactions uh, are uh, um, going to affect the dynamics, importantly. However, not in, a, in, a, a, in no situation could they find some non-monotonic uh, behavior. So you could either have uh, that the drift speed goes uh, uh, down with complexity or goes up with complexity, but uh, uh, you could never find something non-monotonic. So our contribution was to consider something slightly different. So in the work by Webb, they had a regular gel, exactly the same as Matthew showed to us today in the first part of his talk. We consider that if you want to model an agar gel, you could think that another thing might be important so that the gel might not be regular, but it might be cut here and there. So you could have dangling ends, which model agar holes filaments, which here are completely rigid, but we've checked that even if you make them flexible, uh, the results don't change much. And this could uh, uh, affect things uh, a bit in principle because they could provide a way. So in this case, uh, rather than a threading, we could think of a piercing. So the gel could pierce through um, a loop and perhaps uh, change its mobility. And I will try to convince you that this is probably what happens. So. In this case, P is the probability with which we broke one of the um, uh, regular sides in the cube. So if P is zero, we would have a gel made by uh, nice little cubes. And uh, if P is different than zero, we have dangling ends. So I'll try to show the results. Uh, so I'll try to go through the results in the remaining five minutes or so. So this is the drift speed as a function of the average crossing number. This is the unknot, then the trefoil for one. So the knot complexity goes higher here. And there is no surprise that you go a nice linear uh, result. So this is what we ha would happen at weak field. Okay? So at weak field, we reproduce the nice linear behavior that you find in experiment. However, if you run the simulation at a moderate field, you find that uh, you have a hint of this non-monotonicity. So we were quite excited by that and wanted to understand, at least in our simulation, why this comes about. So here, the unknot is not the slowest, but it's faster than the 4-1. The 4-1 is the slowest of all in this particular case. So if, uh, in this case, uh, in the simulation that I showed, uh, there is a bit of irregularity because uh, this simulation takes uh, quite a lot of averaging to do. But there is a clear signature that we find in an electrophoretic arc, which is uh, very similar to the one that uh, people find routinely in experiment when the zero. Uh, so in this case, uh, yeah, the full one is the slowest, but you can change this hierarchy by tu tuning parameters. And episodic and uh, anecdotically, we could see that uh, in the, when we did this simulation, there were cases in which indeed the um, dangling ends of the gel were uh, piercing or threading, with thread, let's use uh, the um, loops. Okay, so one important clue to understand uh, what the reason is for the non monotonicity and that it is indeed linked to the dangling end is that we can redo the same simulation at p equal to zero. So this is a regular gel, this has no dangling ends. So this is the case with dangling ends. You see that the speed is non monotonic with average crossing number or, a, or uh, um, not complexity. In this case, uh, we could never, like in the Weber simulation, we could never find a single case in which we had no monotonicity, always, no mono always monotonic. So there, there can be some discontinuity, but it's always monotonic. So again, in this particular case, this is for a stronger field and uh, a tight gel, and uh, the more complicated knots always go faster. So if you look at single knot trajectories, uh, this is the Position as a function of time, uh, dangling ends, you see that they get stuck. Yeah, several of these guys get stuck. Without dangling ends, they don't get stuck. If you look at the radius of gyration, that is the size, it can oscillate, so the DNA has to move uh, 
um, uh, so that, uh, to swell and contract that is goes through the gel, but you don't see any signature in the velocity curve. And here, on the other hand, again, you get stuck. When you get stuck, your radius generation increases. So this is, again, all due to the threading or piercing. And uh, we wanted to understand this a bit more quantitatively, so we can compute from the molecular dynamics, in this case simulation that we did. They are very similar to the one that uh, Matthew described today, actually. So this is the number of hitting events. So we can ask how often it is that uh, a loop will be impaled on one of the dangling ends. And this is the number of these events. So the unknot is a bit fatter, so it uh, gets impaled a bit more often, you see? But uh, there is a competition, so the unknot uh, would go slower with this because it, goes, uh, uh, it becomes entangled more often. But the disentanglement time as a function of average crossing number has the opposite behavior, and that's the key. So if you have a simple knot, uh, even if it gets entangled, it will be able to undo itself quite quickly, whereas a more complicated knot will take much, a much longer time. And you have to consider the competition between the probability of hitting and the disentangling time, and this is what gives you the um, non-monotonic behavior in the velocity as a function of average crossing number. Indeed, here we made a simple theory. So these are our data, and this is a theory where we don't have fitting parameters. We have matched the fitting parameters to the ones that we have found in the simulation, and we have done a very simple problem in which we have a biased random walk which can hit an impalement and get stuck and can disentangle with the, with the time taken from the distribution probability of times that we measured in simulation. Okay? So we can fit rather well the results here. And this is a predictive uh, data. So these are not molecular dynamic simulation, but this is a simple model. We can change the parameter here, which is the radius duration of the unknot divided by the, thick, the mesh size of the gel. So in going from the black curve to the purple curve, you are essentially making the gel smaller and smaller if you want the polymer larger and larger. What matters is the ratio between the length scales. So you see that the non-monotonicity can be controlled there physically. Yeah? So if you are stuck, you want to, so if you're stuck here, right, the, the unknot, the unknot is not stuck uh, permanently, so it will be able to disengage. Uh, yeah, we want to, so it's, it disentangles from the matrix, in the sense that you have a dangling end which is uh, penetrating, and then you get out, yeah. You can maybe call it something, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, so let me go uh, through briefly the uh, main conclusions uh, and main part of the talk. So in the first part, I showed you that you can do simulation with a coarse grain model where you take into account the Fusilli-like interaction between DNA, so the liquid crystal interaction, and which uh, allow you to understand that the knot spectrum should uh, enhance uh, torus knots as a function of, as, a, um, as opposed to twist knots. By simulating ejection, you can also see that these torus knots uh, get out uh, uh, more quickly and more easily than twist knot. Uh, and I hope you like this, uh, the way to describe them as topological friction. So the topological friction of these knots is lower than that of twist knot. And that's why um, these phages can still be infective, because they, their knots can get out very quickly. And then uh, I showed you some results uh, uh, about uh, uh, how to understand, from a theoretical point of view, the experiments uh, of gel electrophoresis, in particular the non-monotonic behavior which is observed at intermediate strength, where the velocity of a knot first goes down and then goes up again, so which goes against the normal idea that we have that Stokes' law would make faster, uh, more complex knots. Okay? And as I show to you, we have a strong hint or a strong clue that this is linked to the fact that the gel can get entangled temporarily with the polymer. Thank you very much.